question. That's for tomorrow, that's for today. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, so I would like to thank uh, everyone for uh, being here today. And um, I'm thinking how we ended up here. Um, we had originally planned the event uh, to take place in Rome, where uh, I had booked a very nice hotel and I was looking forward to see all my colleagues in Rome. But unfortunately, this did not happen. Uh, nonetheless, I'm very happy that we have the opportunity to um, still do this uh, event and to have uh, all of you here. Um, Pedro did uh, a very good introduction of the points that uh, I will be um, talking about right now. And uh, I think that uh, he gave uh, something like a table of contents. And uh, when I would be talking about uh, the Fit for RRI project, I will be also mentioning about uh, Foster, because uh, as Pedro said, these two projects are interconnected in the sense that uh, they used uh, the platform, uh, that uh, it was already reputable and um, very well used, which was uh, the Foster uh, Open Science uh, Knowledge Base. So on the Foster Open Science Knowledge Base, we created the Fit for RRI Knowledge Base. And uh, the purpose was uh, over there to have uh, the training materials with regards to uh, responsible research and innovation. But because open access is part of responsible research and innovation, then this could have not been um, divided into different sections, but uh, all these uh, resources and training materials should have been uh, together. So if you log into the, if you visit the Fit for RRI page on the Foster platform, then you're going to see that uh, we have a variety of materials. For example, if you go to the top resources, you will see that uh, resources have um, these uh, very small um, um, triangles at the end of um, each uh, uh, window resource. And uh, those triangles indicate uh, the concepts and the projects that these uh, resources were created for. Oh, and for example, the resource in the middle that has an orange triangle on the top uh, right hand side, and at the same time, a blue triangle on the bottom right hand side. Then this indicates that it's a combination of both uh, the FOSTER, so open science, and FIT for RRI, so responsible research and innovation concept. So you can visit the Fit for RRI um, page on the Foster Open Science uh, Knowledge Base. And uh, this is your get gateway to all the training resources and materials uh, that uh, are uh, in the Foster uh, page and RRI page right now. Um, in uh, the beginning of the project, we created the Responsible Research and Innovation Taxonomy. This is not something new because we did this during the Foster uh, project when we were uh, dealing up with the concept of open science. The reason of creating the taxonomy was to be able, first of all, to organize our thoughts on how this uh, specific subject field is being developed and what kind of um, I, uh, notions and uh, concepts and uh, terms are around it. Uh, this was uh, helpful for us to organize our thoughts, but then we also realized that uh, apart from us, there may be others who are not quite uh, knowledgeable on how this uh, brand new concept is being uh, developed around uh, research and what is the umbrella term and which terms have a higher uh, hierarchy or priority over other terms. So when we were creating this taxonomy, we also thought that we would need to create definitions. So if you go on the Foster page and you see that uh, there are, and you see the taxonomy terms and then you click on its term, then you're going to see that you also have um, an explanation of what this term is about. So it's a very good, so that you have a very good understanding of the various concepts. And it's a very good tool for someone who is not very much familiar with uh, all these ideas to get to know these ideas better so that when this person reads about them, understands what the concepts are about. Another um, reason for creating the taxonomy was so that we can also organize the content 
that lives within this knowledge base. So all the content in the knowledge base in the platform, it has um, uh, these cons these uh, it has tags from this taxonomy. So in reality, if you want to read about one thing only, you can click on a taxonomy term and you're going to see grouped under this term all the related topics. Um, alternatively, the other thing that uh, you could uh, be doing is that you would be able to find um, uh, in all these uh, in all these terms you will also be able to see which ones do not have any materials uploaded into the platform this means that you can predict any gaps that uh, are in the area and what is this that you would probably be needing to create as a research support librarians or what kind of questions you you should be expecting from uh, your researchers or PhD students or from your stakeholders in general, because this topic perhaps is not so much developed and uh, you need to pay closer attention to it so that you need to know more about it. Um, of course, as you can see in the, tax in the RRI taxonomy right now, uh, the RRI is the umbrella term and then the very first term is the open science. And uh, what we had already created in the Foster platform was the open science taxonomy. The open science taxonomy has the same reasoning and logic behind as the RRI taxonomy, an uh, area where, where the knowledge had to be grouped in a hierarchical uh, manner, where the terms are being defined, where the resources are being linked to the terms, where we can have an understanding of what uh, is going on in the field. Of course, where, while we were creating both taxonomies, all the project partners were not 100% in agreement with the organization of these terms. And then we spent a lot of time brainstorming and moving terms around. But we understood that at some point we had to stop doing this um, exercise. This is why, even though we understand that perhaps this is not like 100% a representation that you have in your mind, we still believe that it's a very good um, uh, representation of uh, the knowledge in the field uh, nowadays. And uh, for that reason, we have created uh, the taxonomies uh, in, um, um, as pictures in a good quality um, pictures so that you can download them. And we, can, we have also created the RDF uh, files of uh, those images so that you can have those images integrated into your own systems. And those can be downloaded at the link that is provided at the bottom of the slide. So, Apart from the taxonomy, we also created the um, RRI Toolkit. The RRI Toolkit is uh, a page which uh, contains um, courses on responsible research and innovation and open science, because as we said, those two terms go together. And we wanted to make it a, a gateway, like a one-stop place where someone could start learning about uh, a specific topic. Um, and uh, we wanted people to be able to go there and find their way around things, not to feel that they are lost in too much information, not to feel that uh, the environment was not uh, clear, but it had a lot of noise around it so that people would feel overwhelmed. We wanted a tool that would be straightforward and it would have content on the most hot topics relating to this uh, specific um, RRI and open science concept. And uh, of course, uh, these um, courses, they were created by experts in the field who understand the topics and uh, are uh, very much knowledgeable about uh, the various concepts and also about the creation of those uh, short courses. And uh, the other concept that we have in our mind is to um, think of our users, the stakeholders, those who would go and uh, take those courses and get trained. And uh, what we wanted is that we wanted them to leave the page and feel that they have gained skills and they feel that they have gained expertise so that they know that the time that they have invested, it was totally worth it. And they can also go back to their um, uh, daily jobs and uh, uh, apply either to their own research or by training others on uh, those specific um, ideas. <coughs> the, um, 
Therefore, we have created courses that um, are uh, right now hosted at the um, RRI toolkit. And uh, those courses need to are short. They are between an hour and a half and three hours to complete. And uh, the kind of um, inform the kind of features that you're going to find in the course is that we have uh, brief paragraphs, we have uh, images, uh, we have accordions, we have um, created infographics, uh, presentations, uh, we have short videos uh, from experts or animated videos from uh, resources that we already found available on YouTube, for example. So we did not try to create new knowledge. The purpose was uh, primarily to make uh, a combination of both existing knowledge and then look uh, at uh, uh, creating our own, no, our own content if we were not in position to find something new. And um, we, the courses are in English language to begin with, but uh, uh, they have an open license so they can be translated. And uh, for the time being, uh, the, um, the level of uh, knowledge is introductory. And um, the audience uh, varies because uh, our stakeholders vary. So we have a very big um, variety of, of audience that those courses are addressed to, such as PhD students, researchers, um, companies, uh, funders, research administrators. And of course, we have quizzes. This is something that we practiced a lot during the Foster project. And we found out that a quiz makes a user um, understand more uh, the concepts and also uh, gives an incentive on uh, gives a user an incentive to keep um, taking courses and working on them and this is why we created the quizzes so that we are able to as assess uh, the learners but also be able to uh, give them an understanding understanding of how much knowledge they have uh, gained via this course now we have created uh, uh, six uh, courses and uh, all are in basic concepts around uh, responsible research and innovation and RRI. So we wanted it to have a, we wanted to have a course on the introduction of RRI for those who are brand new to the concept and we presented at the very first uh, position in our uh, courses list because this is what we believe the course that everyone should start if uh, someone is not uh, familiar with the concept. And then we took um, basic concepts around RRI uh, that we thought that they were very uh, popular. So for that reason, we created a course on how to engage the public with RRI. Uh, what does RRI mean with regards to companies and industry and how this can be um, conducting business in a more um, RRI uh, way. And then we tried to combine uh, the concept of RRI with uh, existing or perhaps a little bit more uh, used uh, terms such as uh, the um, data ethics or uh, open science or uh, open and fair research data. And of course, the RRI toolkit cannot stand on its own, but it is combined also with uh, the existing um, foster uh, courses that were created uh, and were ready already. So, for example, this is uh, the for example, this is one slide of the responsible research and innovation for companies uh, course which uh, where over there you can see uh, approximately what kind of features each course has. So for example, on the very top, you can see a little bit of the text where it uh, tries to explain a little bit the concept and what is happening right now in this specific case at the European Union uh, level. And then how a company defines its own RRI strategy. So this section over there, it has like very small tips on the side two videos under it, and then at the bottom on your left-hand side, you can see uh, a sample of the quiz uh, questions for this specific uh, course. So all these courses are for free for anyone to take. You don't even have to log in to take them, but you are um, required to log in only when you would like your progress to be tracked, and that's because it is very difficult to track the, your progress if you don't log in, and um, you you need to log in 
uh, in order to get um, um, the badges for the courses. This has not implemented yet, but it's going to be implemented soon and uh, of course before the end of the project. So along with uh, the courses, we are going, as um, uh, Pedro has already uh, announced, we are going to create learning paths. The purpose of the learning paths is not something new. Uh, others are doing it already in other projects, but we also uh, implemented this uh, during the FOSTER project as well, and we saw that it was working uh, very well. Uh, we would like, via the learning paths, to make uh, users uh, be able to make connections between the various courses so that they can then reach the level of understanding and knowledge to a wider concept in the research uh, agenda. And uh, when, you, when a user logs into the course, uh, this means that the, that the progress during the course is being tracked. And this means that the user can gain those badges, which at the end they can be combined together so that the user uh, gets uh, and receives badges for the learning paths that uh, has um, uh, fulfilled. So, for example, uh, we have uh, created four different sections of the learning paths. And the first one, which is the Open Responsible Research uh, Innovator, is the ultimate learning path that someone can have. It contains a lot of uh, courses, and um, it, the courses are a combination between um, RRI courses and FOSTER courses. And uh, the purpose is for someone to uh, gain the vast majority of uh, knowledge that we think that it's needed right now, so that uh, this uh, person is able to understand the concepts of um, RRI and be an open and responsible innovator. But apart from this learning path, we also have the research communicator with uh, another set of courses, uh, the combination of which uh, can help them understand better this specific concept uh, that relates to research communication. And then we have uh, the learning paths uh, three and four. Uh, the one is for the open and responsible researcher, and the other one is for the ethical research data scientist. So all these are being set uh, together so that uh, the user can uh, go into the foster into the RRI toolkit or in the foster platform where the RRI toolkit is and can find their way around it. This gives a quality of uh, information in the platform and it makes um, it easier for the, the um, uh, stakeholders to feel secure about the knowledge that they are getting, that it's not leading them nowhere, but it is leading them somewhere and it gives them incentives to be able to start working on it. And uh, apart from uh, the RRI toolkit, we also have a trainer's directory. Again, this is in uh, combination with uh, the FOSTER platform. So over there, you're going to find the uh, resources relating to um, uh, uh, um, uh, speakers relating to open science, but you're going to be also able to find speakers relating to RRI as well. When you visit the page, you're going to be able to see on the very top that there are three filters. Um, and the one is uh, a filter where you can choose by topic, a filter where you can choose by audience, or a filter where you can choose by the uh, language. So the um, uh, strainer's directory is an international directory. And uh, even if you plan to have an event at your local knowledge, visit the RRI trainers directory because there are many chances that you're going to find a speaker who will be able to train your local uh, language, who would be able to speak your local language in case uh, you are having concerns whether a presentation in um, English, for example, uh, may not be understandable by everyone because uh, we do understand that uh, 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 all these uh, terms are very difficult to conceive, especially if they are uh, presented for the first time to someone in another uh, language. Uh, so with regards to the specific RRI trainers, this is uh, the um, people that we have uh, for the time being. And uh, these uh, trainers are in position to present uh, results, uh, to present uh, both in um, 
RRI and Open Science events. But uh, if uh, you are looking for uh, trainers in um, your uh, own area, and uh, I understand that now due to COVID, you may be doing online events, but let's say in the future at some point, if you would like to have a face-to-face -face event when we go on back to the uh, normal um, and more traditional way of uh, training, uh, those uh, people could also identify other local uh, trainers um, in uh, various areas. But uh, nonetheless, if you have any questions or if you would like to use uh, any of uh, these contacts, you should uh, send us an email at e-learning at Foster Open Science EU and uh, we would be happy to train, to help you with this. So in total, what we have uh, found so far uh, is that um, the project and the toolkit has uh, received a lot of attention from our stakeholders. Uh, as uh, Pedro has already um, announced, uh, um, RRI has uh, uh, promoted some events during the course of the project, but uh, in general, at the Foster uh, Open Science uh, platform, uh, there were 55 events uh, created which had the RRI tag and 145 on Open Science. And the reason that I am presenting these two concepts together is because the open science term is something that we had uh, be before the RRI term. And because, well, as I said uh, at the beginning of uh, my presentation, the term open science is an important term in the RRI umbrella. Therefore, uh, I'm going to be presenting those concepts together uh, here in our statistics. And uh, apart from the 55 RRI events, we had 145 open science events. Uh, new users, 3,433. With regards to the content, it was 446 new RRI-related uh, uh, materials uh, uploaded into the platform, 22 RRI courses, and uh, we had a vast uh, majority of uh, both of uh, monthly views and uh, um, uh, daily views. And uh, this is everything. Thank you so much for your attention. And I think I will have to go back to Antonio and I'm going to stop sharing. Yes, thank you, Nancy, uh, for this. And uh, without uh, delay, uh, I'm uh, giving the floor to Emma Harris from Orion, uh, representing the Orion project. Uh, Emma, can you please uh, start sharing? Hi, uh, thank you. Right, uh, yes, I will start sharing in just one moment when I can get hold of this. Uh... Right, share screen, here we go. Uh, okay. Share. And move that, present. Okay, can everyone see that? Um, I don't know why I always ask that as if you're going to uh, say yes, but I assume it's all okay. So, okay. Yes, yes, uh, yes. Perfect, lovely, great, thanks. Um, yeah, so um, lessons learned from Orion Open Science and RRI training. Um, so some of this is a little similar to what uh, we've already discussed. It was very interesting to hear uh, from all of you about um, what you've done, and we've followed a, quite a similar pattern um, ourselves, but I'll, tr I'll try and bring in a few new elements. And if we get time, uh, I've even got a couple of Mentimeter things we can do to just do a little uh, taster of some of the elements. But uh, we'll see how we go for time on that one. Okay, so uh, the Orion project, um, EU SWAFS uh, project aimed at uh, increasing the amount of open science and RRI in our FPOs. Um, this involves doing a, a number of things, uh, co-creation experiments, um, public dialogues. Uh, we funded two citizen science projects. Um, and uh, they, they, well, one of them is slightly uh, held up by the pandemic, but the other one's uh, doing very well in terms of uh, development. Um, we also did an art science piece. That's the, the picture, the second one down on the left, uh, which was where a, an artist did a residency at the Max Del Brook Center and then represented her ideas about um, genome editing and aging. And that was very interesting. Um, 
We've also, we also do a podcast um, every other week um, where we interview people about different open science um, topics. And of course we do the training, um, which is what the focus of what I'm gonna talk about now. Uh, so we're Work Package 4. Uh, we're based, as I, as I said, at the Maxtell Brooks Centre uh, in Berlin. And we do the Open Science and RRI training. Um, so that's myself uh, and then the uh, Work Package leader, uh, Louisa Bengtsson, and uh, our colleague Zoe Ingram. Uh, now, Zoe did uh, an interesting gap analysis where she looked at uh, the research institutes in the EU Life Alliance, uh, so uh, flagship um, uh, microbiology type, you know, life science type organizations. And she looked at what training they did and did they have any open science aspect. And as you can see from this big, massive gray box, most of them in 2018 did not. Um, I would imagine that picture looks very different now, not least because of the efforts of um, a, a number of projects like ourselves and, and Fit for RRI. Um, and the one that had the most was CRG, who of course were um, very much part of the Foster project that's been mentioned. Um, so they, they had, some of them had elements of say science communication or open data, um, but very few had specific open science training. So having established that there was a, a need for open science training, uh, we then um, thought about our audience and those were, you know, PhD researchers, research managers, policy makers, funders. Um, so we divided the training loosely into researchers and funders and research managers. So we, we delivered slightly different training, as you can imagine, for those two groups. So the training we delivered, we did nine uh, half or full day training workshops where we were the, uh, the main event, if you will. And then we did 23, 23 conference workshops and seminars where we came in for an hour or two and just did a workshop as part of a bigger event. Uh, that was across 13 countries. Um, we also did three webinars. I think that might have increased by now. Uh, we did two live runs of the MOOC, which I'll talk about, the Massive Open Online course. And we're doing a train the trainer in October, so next month. So the in-person workshops uh, were structured around um, different activities. Uh, so we'd usually start with a question board where people could raise their motivations for being there and also ask a question. And that was a good way because it meant at the end we could go through all the questions and make sure everybody had their question answered. Uh, we do a card activity, uh, which is based on the Foster Open Science Cafe cards and also the HERI uh, similar, similar development. Um, so we give those out and um, in pairs, people would talk about their card and whether they agreed or disagreed. It was a nice icebreaker and also it got people thinking about the issues behind open science and RRI. And if we get a chance, I'll show you how we've adapted that a little bit to the online world that we now live in. Uh, we also did brain walking. Um, this is where people all have a marker pen. There's three flip charts with topics, so open access, open data, and science communication were the usual ones. And everyone walks around and basically brainstorms in silence by writing uh, any tools or ideas or what have you uh, on that. Case studies are fairly self-explanatory. Role play, this is where someone is the bad guy and uh, then the two or three other people in the group have to persuade them of open science. And that's uh, always a nice one to do after lunch. It really wakes people up. It's uh, quite a high energy thing. Then we did meet the expert. And I think this is really important and kind of goes towards some of the things, um, you know, uh, Nancy was talking about in terms of um, localized experts. Now this, we, we didn't do this in, in a different language, but in terms of having that local knowledge, that institutional knowledge, or national knowledge, I think this is really important. So this was our way of trying to get around that, which was we'd have like a librarian or a senior researcher come in and give a presentation about what open, the status of open science and RRI was like in that institution. Um, but we also gave a presentation to kind of ensure everybody understood all the major terms. And then at the end, we do something called individual action plans, which was basically uh, people wrote, wrote what they would do in one, week, one month, and one year for open science and RRI. 
And again, uh, Zoe Ingram did some analysis on this to look at what people were actually saying they would do. Um, and you can see that they far and away the, the, the biggest one is the almost last one from the bottom is further educate myself on open science. And I think this was really important in showing us that um, our primary role as trainers were to provoke, um, you know, that, that position change, to, to wake people up, up to the fact that open science was a thing that they could use and that, um, that the, you know, that there were um, these tools and things available and to give them that insight into those, um, those concepts as opposed to uh, maybe more hard say open data training which is uh, more of a skills based training um so we what we were doing was more kind of um raising awareness than um maybe training in detailed um you know like i say skill training um but we did do more sort of skill based training in the the mooc which um Yes, so I'm hopefully going to show you a video. I don't even know, I don't think you'll get sound, but you might get the, the video. So this is the, um, the MOOC, the Massive Open Online course that we developed. It was six modules across six weeks, uh, each dealing with different aspects of open science. And there were expert contributors from across um, Europe. No, that did not work. Uh, hold on. Yeah, so um, that hopefully give you a kind of uh, taster uh, of what the, the course kind of involves. So we had forums and so forth um, to encourage a kind of feeling of community. And we ran it live. So people did it between set dates. As you can see here, the last one ran 10th of February 2020. That's when it started. Um, and now it's standalone so people can take it any time. Obviously, we try and answer questions and so forth for the duration of the project. Uh, we had uh, over 300 participants. Um, we have a 25% completion rate, which is, I don't know um, how familiar you are with e-learning, but the um, completion rates are usually very, very low, like anything between 2 and 5%. Um, but I think even those who didn't <coughs> do the full course and sort of get the certificate, um, still benefited from doing maybe uh, one or two modules and now it's completely standalone and open people can come and just do whichever modules they wanted uh they want to so i mean we found that was um it was it was it was quite challenging obviously um but it was a really good experience and the feedback we got was was brilliant um so yeah i mean if anybody wants to ask me more specific questions about that i'm happy to to talk about that uh so yeah this i was going to do the training activity uh do we have time for that it'll take like three minutes i imagine five minutes maybe yes i think it's okay okay so uh then oh i've got a typo there um so yeah go to uh, mentimeter and type in that code and um hopefully this will work <laughs> so Uh, meanwhile, uh, I will ask uh, also if you, if, if you have uh, questions, please do type them in the chat. Thank you.
Okay, this is working very nicely. Um, it's good to see. Uh, yeah, so this is, as I was saying, this is our, our like uh, adaptation of the Foster card game. Um, and um, yeah, what we would do if we had more time is uh, we'd do this and then we'd have breakout groups and a discussion um, so that people could could talk a little bit about why they, they formed those opinions. Um, but um, yeah, this is just to show you kind of one of the adaptations uh, that we've made and that you know, to maybe start thinking about, I mean, I don't think COVID's going away anytime soon, unfortunately. Um, so we need to be thinking about future proofing our research. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about that um, just at the end very quickly. Okay. So I'm gonna give it uh, a couple more seconds and then I'll move on to the next one. Okay, so yes, um, interesting, the, the split in opinion actually. Um, scientific publishing will always be dominated by commercial publishing houses so that we have we have some cynics i think that 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 um, aren't as optimistic as i would be about the future but that's um yeah uh, at the same time perhaps they're just realists so yeah okay um so you see how this works and um you can see how this could be used to spark discussion so um the next one best arguments for open science and ri so basically like just uh elevator pitches just really really just quick arguments uh, that you've heard, you know, maybe in a couple of words. Um, this is kind of to uh, represent the role play thing. So if, again, if we had more time, uh, I would do, uh, you'd have to maybe put the best uh, counter arguments. So why shouldn't we have it? And then you'd have, you know, best arguments for, um, so for and against, um, and you could do that in groups or whatever. Um, because obviously the role playing thing doesn't really work in in a video chat situation uh because you've you've got a situation where um you'd be talking over each other uh, which really doesn't work in 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 a video thing you can really only one person can talk at once so um yeah this would be a way of of again kind of having that um nice just science done right um having that without the the uh, the need for the sort of vocal back and forth, if you understand what I mean. Um, so I'm going to give people a, a, a little bit more time for that, um, because obviously you've got to write things. Democracy, yeah, cool. <laughs> Adapting science to a changing society, impact, visibility, transparent. Open science will improve the reproducibility of scientific results. Social return on money invested in research. Transparency, trust in and quality of science. These are lovely. Make the research accessible for maximize the investment in science more transparent.
So I'll take one more and then I will get back to the presentation because there was a couple more things I wanted to say um, very quickly. There we go, nine, perfect. It's nice and symmetrical on my screen. Improving transparency and quality of, the, of research workflows and outcomes. That's excellent, yeah. So yeah, that, as I said, would be an adaptation of the role play uh, exercise. Uh, so let me just um, present, okay, right, um, so just a quick word about the train the trainer that we're doing, um, so it's, uh, we're running that from the 19th of October to the 4th of November, it's a hybrid model, so in, uh, asynchronous and synchronous training. Uh, which again, I have a typo and that's really, really bothering me. I'm actually going to change that. Um, okay, synchronous uh, learning. So that basically what it is, is there's live webinars and then there's an e-learning course that people can do at their own pace. That's what that means, basically. Uh, we're going to have 21 participants. We had to actually limit it um, because the course will culminate in um, the participants in groups of three, uh, doing micro trainings for the Berlin Science Week. So we're going to have a day where there's an open science cafe and um, twice an hour, so for 20 minutes, at, like on the hour and then half past the hour, uh, the groups do a micro training in a topic of open science. So we had to limit the number of participants, unfortunately, because obviously they could, the, we couldn't have sort of 100 micro trainings. Um, so we, we had applications and we have our successful applicants represent um, 17 different countries from, from all over the world. And that's, this is what I actually wanted to say about COVID and future proofing is that while, of course, there are many advantages of in real life training, it can limit the people who can attend in terms of geography and um, cost and so forth. So while um, it's nice to have that human connection and to be do, able to do certain things, I think even when the pandemic is over, we should think about training that allows people who are maybe not in Europe um, or not in these big institutions to be involved. Um, because we've got you know, applications from you know, Kenya and Malaysia and so forth, and those people would never have been able to partake of this um, if they, if, if it hadn't been for COVID, if it hadn't been the fact that we switched to everything online. Um, so I, I, yeah, I just, as, as like, I, I would like to talk about this in the, in the next session as well, but going forward, I think we really need to think about ensuring that we include more, more people and using online technology to do that and be more, um, more global, if you like. Yeah. So that's the trick. Um, sorry, uh, Emma, we really need to wrap up. Because yeah, we... <laughs> I have literally one more slide. That's it. Then I'm Thank done. You. Yeah, no problem at all. Sorry, I knew I was running over time. Uh, yeah, so the key principles that we use, we focus on professional benefits, kind of what's in it for the, the researchers or the funders, like what can they gain from it? Encourage peer-to-peer -peer learning. I think I demonstrated that. So it's about people talking to each other, not us talking at them. Uh, emphasizing concrete but achievable next steps. So that's the individual action plans. And uh, the other thing I'd say is utilize existing resources and people, um, which I think has been demonstrated by the other presentations anyway. You know, don't reinvent the wheel. You probably have expertise and um, existing training packages there. Uh, everything that we've made is on Zenodo, um, and uh, you can, you can um, use it. It's all CC BY, of course. So, um, and also just contact us if you, if you have any questions or want anything. Right, that's it. Sorry, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Emma. This is this was really interesting, and thank you for your contribution. Uh, I think we can uh, make any questions that uh, people may have in the following session because we will be talking about the community involvement uh, for RRI and also the contributions of uh, the Foster Plus projects and Fit for RRI and Orion. We will be having uh, Irina Kushma from Eiffel and she's also the coordinator for the community of practice of training coordinators from uh, open air and also Eloy Rodriguez for uh, 
which was the coordinator for the uh, Foster Plus project. And so uh, we will can all meet in the in the next next session and uh, we will talk some more on, on all of these uh, matters. OK, so thank you so much. Uh, you can see the link for the next session in the chat. So uh, we will be starting in four minutes. OK, we really need to close here. So thank you all, uh, Emma and Pedro and Nancy, uh, for this. And let's meet in a few minutes in the next uh, session. Thank you. OK, perfect. So be aware of the, of the link for the next session. So we can have five minutes of a break and then join the other session. So Emma, we can raise some of these issues in the, in the next, uh, let's discuss. We have also two Mentimeters for the discussion, to help the discussion, sure. to, to discuss around this community of practice. Let's, let's do, okay? Thank you very much. Thanks, bye. So the links are in the chat, so for those that are still connected, you feel free to, to click and access the other session. Okay, thank you. Tu, tu és um fitrião também?